My name is Seth. Um, I'm one of the several student um, and community organizers from Broad Coalition who helped to organize the event this evening. Um, so after, after the Fukushima Daiichi um, catastrophe that happened this past spring, um, some friends and I were discussing and debating the myriad issues um, surrounding nuclear power. Some of us have fears about safety, public health, and environmental degradation, and others feel that nuclear power might be the best alternative to even riskier forms of energy. Ultimately, however, we found that we each had a lot to learn. So we organized this event with the help of Remembering Hiroshima, Imagining Peace, and here we are. Throughout our planning process, we slowly distilled a core question for the evening that we hoped to gather more information on. And that question is this. What role, if any, does nuclear power play in getting us to a more sustainable energy future? Now, this question surely won't be definitively answered tonight, but we certainly hope to have a respectful and healthy debate to help us all walk away with a better understanding of the issues from different perspectives. So how are we gonna do this tonight? We're gonna start off with some panelist presentations, um, and then we're gonna transition into some questions that the organizers have come up with um, from our moderator. And then we'll open the questions up to you all uh, to hear what you have to say. Um, and we welcome comments during that period as well. We do ask that you please prepare your questions or comments before stepping to the microphone uh, by writing it down in the notes section on your program or on a note card from the front table uh, before you step to the mic. We also ask that you keep your question or comment as short as possible so that we can hear as many uh, comments and questions as possible. Speakers will be each given one minute maximum at the microphone, but shorter is better. Uh, this event will go to about 9 p.m. this evening, uh, maybe a, a smidge later, at which time the audience is definitely invited to uh, mingle and enjoy some refreshments in the back of the room. Uh, if you need to leave early, then please do so quickly and quietly. Uh, we ask for everyone to be respectful of those speaking, uh, and please no shouting or back commentary from the audience. Uh, there will be a, a space for comments and questions after the presentations. And also, please, please, please silence your cell phones um, so that we don't have to worry about that interrupting our great panelists and all the wonderful things we have to say here tonight. Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our, our esteemed panel this evening. We're going to start off with uh, Dr. Uh, Patricia DeMarco. She is the director of the Rachel Carson Institute at Chatham University. Uh, and then we will uh, hear from Dr. Larry Falk, the founder of the Nuclear Energy Certificate Program in Pitt Swanson School of Engineering here. Uh, and then we'll hear from uh, Michael Marriott, the Executive Director of the Nuclear Information Resource Service based in Washington, D.C. Thanks, Mike, for coming all the way up here from, uh, from Washington. Uh, and then lastly, we'll close with Dr. Gregory Reed, uh, who is the Director of the Power and Energy Initiative here in Pitt Swanson School of Engineering. So, without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce our moderator this evening, uh, Ward Alibach, who's a good friend of mine and uh, a lecturer in the Environmental Studies Department here at the University of Pittsburgh to start us off this evening. Hope you have a good time. Thanks. Thank you, Seth. Uh, thank all of you for coming. I'd like to also thank the uh, Remembering Hiroshima, Imagining Peace Project, Free the Planet, uh, Student Government, uh, Engineers for a Sustainable World, Pittsburgh Student Environmental Coalition, uh, the Students for Nuclear Energy here at Pitt, um, Seth himself, Becky, uh, James, Jenna, uh, Eva, anyone who had any connection with putting this together tonight, I think this is a wonderful thing. Uh, it's going to be very challenging to get through the complexities of the nuclear energy debate uh, in just two hours. You might all say, in just two hours, but it's true. This is a very, very complex issue. Uh, there are a lot of very well-meaning people on both sides of the issue, so please be respectful of everyone's point of view tonight. Uh, without further ado, as Seth would say, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Patricia DeMarco. Good evening. It's my great joy and delight to be here tonight and figure out how this works. I don't know if any of you remember the days when we were recovering from the atomic war of, that dropped bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and decided that we were going to use nuclear power for peaceful purposes, the peaceful atom. And there was a sentiment at that time that this kind of energy was so efficient and effective that it would be too cheap to meter. 
and it was debated and jousted about in the halls of Congress in the early part of the 50s, and President Eisenhower was vehement about using the atoms for peaceful purposes. Realize we made a commitment to this technology before the days when the structure of DNA was known, and before we fully understood the long-time life cycle of radioactivity interface with living, living materials, both human and otherwise. So this is one of the things that are of concern here, is the unintended consequences of good intentions. So when we look at the future of atomic power, to understand that we took it on with great intention, no one expected some of the complications that we've been encountering. However, it is my opinion at this point, and I'm a geneticist by training, I got involved with this industry partly out of concern from exposure of workers in the nuclear industry and also the workers and the people who mine and develop the uranium ores. Nuclear power and nuclear reactions are unsafe to the biosphere. They are an inherently inefficient power source and it is an unnecessary an unnecessarily risky technology to pursue. So that is the way I felt about this since about 1973. Everything that I have seen since that time has just amplified that opinion. Um, and I'm sure there are people who disagree with this vehemently, but I'd like to explain it a bit. First of all, we are not isolated in one place or another. We are an interconnected system in a biosphere that is connected by movement of air and water all over the world. The cycles of the water cycle that go from the oceans into the clouds and down onto the ground carry materials throughout the world in a space of time that is within our experience on a daily basis. We have everything in the world connected to us because we share the water and we share the air and we all depend on fertile ground for our food. We are part of a living system for which the earth is our life support. And contamination of our life support system in ways that are cumulative and long lasting only degrades the quality of living creatures all over the world, including ourselves. We are part of a living biosphere. The habitat of humanity is the living world, not the built environment. And so we need to look at how the things that we do to meet our daily requirements, our needs, are interacting with the living cycles of the world. So when you have contamination in the ocean, you are also contaminating the food supply chain, you're contaminating the air that goes all around the earth, you're contaminating the ground on which particles fall all over the earth. Radiation has undisputed health effects. Um, there are several exposure pathways. You can inhale radioactivity from contaminated sources uh, when particles are volatilized into the air. You can ingest them either by um, things that are on surfaces or that are actually incorporated into the food chain by having radionuclides um, built into the calcium or other components of living organisms that become part of our food chain or you can be contaminated by direct exposure, which is a relatively rare um, form of, it, of um, contamination. The exposure effects are really of two categories. You have chronic kinds of effects that um, are manifest over a long period of time that are usually uh, seen in terms of being cancer causing, which may be manifested from being um, uh, a damage that happens at a time of exposure that is manifested over a long period of time. You can have mutations that take place in a developing fetus and are, are manifest as birth defects, or you can have genetic mutations that are long-lasting effects that are transmitted over generations. And then the other category is acute exposures, which would only be happening in the time of an actual nuclear accident, in which case you would have radiation burns or radiation poisoning. Um, and these kinds of things are more acute, but are uh, much more serious. Um, this is the kind of thing that happens in an acute exposure. Um, you can see the different um, degrees of levels 
of um, effects that might happen. Uh, this kind of um, effect has been documented, for example, in the people who went in to clean up the initial um, exposures of Chernobyl. Uh, they had over 100,000 mostly military personnel come in to initially remove and sequester the highly contaminated areas there. Um, the tracking and monitoring of the health exposure of that population of people has revealed some significant increases in both cancers and a variety of other um, abnormalities and disturbances, both in themselves and also in their families. Um, the radiation effects at the cellular level happen because when a radioactive material it affects the DNA, it can cause mutations from um, either breaking or dislocating the uh, structure of the DNA molecule in ways that then can be transmitted to the next generation or to the next generation of cells. Um, it is this ability of radiation to interact with DNA that really has become um, one of the reasons that even uh, diagnostic x-rays and things are monitored very carefully. You know, you have the lead shield on when you have dental x-rays. And if you have a situation where chronic exposure from um, materials that accumulate in the biosphere can be dangerous because if they are in something like strontium or um, cal or cesium, which become incorporated into bone tissue, or if it's tritiated water, your cells have water in them, and they don't fall. They don't have a long distance for the radiation energy to travel in order to affect a cell. And some of these materials are very long lived, and as they accumulate in the biosphere, they go up the food chain, and we are at the top. So that you end up with um, potentials for exposure that are sort of insidious and have a ha have a way of being manifest over time. You can't say for sure that exposure to a person at this time is going to yield this result in this period of time and it's going to be a cause and effect relationship because it's a non-specific exposure and you have a variety of ways depending on what cell is affected, depending on what or organ system is affected, you're going to have a different effect, which is one of the complexities of this whole process. Um, you don't see it, you don't necessarily feel it right away, so it's kind of an insidious chronic situation that poses um, a difficulty for public health issues. However, um, you do have uh, radiation inherited effects. They've been documented tremendously much both in the aftermath of Hiroshima and this is in the aftermath of Chernobyl. Um, and it is difficult when you are coping with large populations that have been exposed um, to accidental um, high levels um, to be able to predict who is going to be exposed and whether it will be immediate or whether it will be in a following generation. And this is one of the serious ethical responsibilities that I think we face with nuclear power. Um, there is no dispute in the um, medical arena that there is a health risk from exposure to radiation and even therapeutic amounts are used judiciously and always balancing the risk with the benefit, but having a large-scale situation where you are in, um, in perpetuity, putting into the biosphere high-intensity radioactive material that needs to be monitored and watched forever imposes a burden on the biosphere that we need to have custody over, and this is, I think, a legacy that we've already given our children. My second point Nuclear power is extremely inefficient. Now, I don't have a pointer, and I apologize to those of you who haven't seen this graph before, but um, this is the picture of our national energy flow from fuels on the far, um, far left to you. It shows you all of the different fuels that we use and what we use them for. And then on the far right, you'll see that the rejected energy exceeds in amount the used energy. We actually waste more energy from the fuels that we burn than we use to do useful work. When you generate electricity with the complex process of boiling water, turning a turbine, creating electricity from steam, only one third of the fuel value actually becomes useful work. 
no matter whether it's nuclear, coal, natural gas, whatever. If you're burning a fuel through the Rankine cycle to make electricity, two-thirds of that value is lost as heat. And you notice that we only use a relatively small amount of our electricity electricity production process from nuclear power to begin with. I would contend that this Rankine cycle process that was put together in the early 1900s is time to move on. It's time to move to something that can be more efficient, more effective in meeting the work requirements that we use energy for. And I would argue to you that we have a large number of options that are based on sustainable sources that do not require that we poison the earth forever in order to meet our energy requirements and meet the needs that we have for heat, for space conditioning, for appliance services, for lighting, for manufacturing. We need to be more diligent and productive in making use of what we already know and these are not technologies that are someday off into the future. They are not technologies that require tremendous amounts of research. However, if you think about it, how many of you have a cell phone? Okay, The power in that cell phone is greater than the, the computer that put the first lunar landing on the moon. And it's much smaller than the first. Am I done already? You're kidding. Okay, I have only two more slides. Okay. <laughs> the, um, the amount of engineering and technology that we have spent on the existing fossil and nuclear fuel systems has not yet been applied to the renewable and sustainable systems. We have a lot of options to, pur to pursue to make these services to us. Nuclear power, free nuclear power does exist. And this is the statement of William McDonough he says, I love nuclear power. I love clean nuclear power. I'm especially fond of fusion. I think we should spend trillions of dollars immediately on fusion capture. And thank God, literally, we already have our reactor, the sun, exactly where we need it, 93 million miles away. I would contend to you that if we spend some time, energy, and investment, and government subsidies, such as the Price-Anderson Act, which underwrites the nuclear power insurance industry and underwrites exploration and development for fossil fuels. If we spent that kind of intensity of effort on capturing and using renewable resources, we could choose to have a living earth for our children instead of one that is facing constant monitoring and vigilance and the perpetual uh, maintenance of the custody over poisons. You have to think about our great-grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. They have a right to have a healthy and viable future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. DeMarco. Uh, next up is Dr. Larry Polk. Thank you. I have been asked to uh, address four issues associated with Fukushima. First will be a brief description of what happened at the Fukushima plant. This is factual information that I have received from the literature and the reading that I have done on this. This is before the accident happened on March 11, 2011. Here you see a lineup of six boiling water reactors at the Fukushima site on the eastern shore of Japan. On March 11th, we had a magnitude 9.0 on the Richter scale earthquake, fourth largest earthquake in history, and it moved Japan eight feet, followed by a tsunami, which uh, inundated the Japan coast and it affected the entire Pacific Ocean. Indeed, the devastation was tremendous. And it's important, I think, to put the consequences of this event in context. The plant did not suffer a disaster. The earthquake and tsunami were disasters. This was not an accident. The plant experienced a natural event, an act of God in insurance parlance, far beyond what it was designed for. 
total number of people who died in the earthquake and the tsunami that it generated is still being assessed, but we're looking at numbers like 27,000 dead and missing in some 300,000 homes. Some of the basics of nuclear fission that you didn't see on the uh, slides as you came in. When fission occurs, it yields a lot of energy, more neutrons, and then you have something called fission products. Those fission products are radioactive, and even though you may shut the reactor down and stop the fission process, you cannot start the release of the energy being emitted from those decay heat products. Each fission is uh, radioactive. Those fission products are toxic, and if they get into an uncontrolled environmental release, that can be detrimental to people and the environment. So, we nuclear engineers have designed reactor safety systems to prevent the release of those fission products. And we do that by something we call defense in depth. The first depth barrier is the fuel pellet itself, a ceramic which retains most of the fission products within the pellet. That's surrounded by cladding, which then encapsulates the fuel and the fission products. Finally, we have a, uh, the reactor cool-up system itself, which is a cylindrical pressure vessel that constitutes barrier three. And finally, the last piece of the defense in depth is the containment, barrier four. Here you see the containment of a Mark I reactor, like that was at Fukushima. Now, we have had nuclear accidents in the past. You've all heard of TMI in 1979. Here the containment was what prevented the release of fission products to the environment. That was followed by Chernobyl in 1986. It did not have containment. It was a reactor which could not be licensed in the Western world because of its design flaws. And now in Fukushima in 2011, we have had the failure of the emergency cooling systems due to the tsunami. Here is the containment of the Fukushima Daiichi uh, reactor. It's made up of something called a dry well. It uh, looks like a pear-shaped inverted light bulb surrounded by something called a torus or a wet well. In order to ensure that the emergency systems work, the engineers design systems with redundancy, flexibility, diversity, and physical separation. However, if the fuel melts and can enter the environment, you can have real dangers. Fission products are radioactive and others are quite toxic. And if it does get into the environment, we have many pathways that the fission products and the radioactivity can get to the population. Now, the Fukushima incident involved multiple failures at several units as a result of the tsunami. We believe the reactors have suffered damage and fuel has been melted. But the situation is evolving, and we really don't know all the facts yet at this time. But the following slides are sort of an animation that follows the events leading to the fuel melting at the Fukushima plant. Here you see the reactor system in its normal operation. I point out to you at the bottom something called the dry well, that's the inverted light bulb, and the wet well, which is the torus, or the wet well, surrounding the uh, reactor system. On March 11th, the earthquake hit, and the reactor did what it was supposed to do. It tripped, the rods went in, and the fission process was shut down. But note that even after one day, the decay heat from those radioactive fission products are producing 1% of full reactor power. That energy must be removed by emergency cooling systems. The diesel generators designed to come on in an emergency, they did come on, they started, and it looks like for the first hour the plant is in a stable and safe state. And then the tsunami hit. When the tsunami hit, the water level was twice as much as what had been designed for. Can you imagine a water wall of 42 feet? This is not something that happens that frequently. But this caused something called a station blackout because the earthquake took out all of the off-site connections to electrical power. The tsunami removed the emergency diesel generators and their fuel systems. And so here we were without any electricity whatsoever to drive the emergency systems to cool the 
reactor. Ah, but we have a backup system called the reactor core isolation cooling system, in which uses steam from the reactor to drive a turbine-driven pump that will continue to provide emergency fill water and keep the decay heat levels cooled off. But that RICSI system requires batteries in order to keep valves in a certain alignment. And when the batteries ran out, those valves closed and we no longer had the RICSI. So here we are in a situation where the lowering of the water level in the reactor pressure vessel exposes and damages the core. When the fuel heats up without cooling water around it, the zirconium cladding starts to have a reaction with the hot steam. And that reaction emits hydrogen gas. And that hydrogen gets pushed into the dry well and then into the wet well. The containment pressure starts to build up because heat is being removed, but there is no cooling water coming into the vessel and the core in order to keep it from failing. The hydrogen is evolved in the hydrogen water reaction, and that hydrogen burns in the service building, and it causes an explosion which does deteriorate, or you might say it destroys the secondary containment, but it's quite spectacular, but of minor safety relevance because the dry well and the wet well are still in service. But those wet well and dry well now are believed to have failed and they are releasing a certain amount of fission products to the environment. That's not the whole story. The spent fuel taken out of a reactor still has decay heat, but it is, it is put into spent fuel pools where the water of that spent fuel pool provides the shielding and the cooling. That spent fuel pool is not under any containment. That decay heat is still causing that water of the spent fuel pool to boil. That water level boils and the level goes down and actually uncovers then the spent fuel in the spent fuel pool. So the accident response on a short term, people evacuated the Fukushima area. People wore masks to prevent inhalation of the fission products that were released and iodine tablets were given to those who were affected because if iodine is taken as a pill, it will saturate the thyroid to preclude the radioactive iodine from the release to get into the uh, thyroid gland. On the long term, monitoring of the environmental pathways, decontamination and burial of the contaminated waste. Now, if there is any good news associated with this event, I would say that every major accident that has happened has led to significant improvements in safety culture, reactor design, emergency planning, and public education. The next generation reactors will be safer, not despite Fukushima, but because of it. The second thing I was asked to address is the overview of reactor safety standards and how strictly they are actually followed. The United States framework for regulation is a very stringent and strong framework coupled by a commitment by the industry to continually evaluate and improve safety. The industry is working with the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission to enhance the safety of nuclear plants and capture the lessons that have been learned from Fukushima in Japan. And within days of the earthquake and the tsunami in Japan, the U.S. nuclear industry launched a thorough review of safety preparations. And in spite of Fukushima, the government of the United States is still very supportive of nuclear power. Statements by President Obama, DOE Secretary Chu, Marvin Pertel, President of the Nuclear Energy Institute. Okay? Third question, has the Fukushima accident, excuse me, incident, I refrain of calling this as an accident, has it changed safety standards in America or internationally? And my response to that is yes, it will, without a doubt. Prolonged lack of reactor electrical power must be precluded. Better means of the control of hydrogen buildup in the case of fuel damage is required. And we must examine the treatment of the fuel in the spent fuel pools. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission has put out its recommendations of the three-month report on enhancing reactor safety in the 21st century. Finally, I was asked to discuss the safety issues surrounding spent fuel management. Spent fuel pools 
will be examined and redesigned, I believe. They will not be in the proximity of the reactor core, the reactor pressure vessel, or the containment. Spent fuel pools should be subject to similar design requirements as a reactor core in order to ensure adequate cooling. And we need new passive designs of spent fuel pools away from the actual plant's reactor core. And that will end my remarks, and I uh, welcome the next speaker. But I must I have some backup slides, I think, which I must go quickly through in order to get to Mr. Marriott's. Thank you, Dr. Folk. Uh, I'd like that now to introduce Mr. Michael Moriet. Marriott. Marriott, ah. Hi, thank you. I am Michael Marriott. I'm Executive Director of Nuclear Information and Resource Service. Uh, we're based in Washington, D.C. Uh, we've been around since 1978, and I personally have been there since 1985. We work with hundreds of grassroots activist groups uh, across the U.S., hundreds more across the world, uh, groups that are concerned about nuclear power, radioactive waste, radiation, and sustainable energy issues. Nuclear power is sometimes called clean energy. Clean energy plants do not explode and release toxic radiation across the world. Uh, this is, as Dr. Polk noted, this is, this was, this is uh, Unit 3 at Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, this was a GE Mark I reactor. Uh, <clears throat> the Atomic Energy Commission of the United States was told in September of 1971 by one of its top safety officials that this design was deficient and should not be licensed in the United States. Uh, his boss, said, well, you know, I kind of agree, but that could be the end of nuclear power in the United States. Uh, in 1986, uh, in 1976, three GE engineers quit uh, GE in protest over the continued marketing of this design. In 1986, the top safety official, it was then the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Harold Denton, said, these reactors under accident conditions have a 90% chance of containment failure. That is what containment failure looks like. This is the explosion at Unit 1 of Fukushima. Uh, it was caused by the buildup of hydrogen gas. This took place less than 24 hours after the earthquake. Uh, there are some, and, and Dr. Polk is exactly correct that there are, there's a lot we don't know about Fukushima yet, about the exact accident sequences and all that. There is some reason to believe that at this particular unit, uh, there was damage caused by the earthquake, in fact, even before the tsunami hit. Uh, there were some high radiation readings, or at least some reports of high radiation readings before the tsunami hit, and some other pro potential problems. So this one may have suffered some damage from the earthquake, but otherwise, uh, it was the tsunami that caused the real problems. This is the explosion two days later at Unit 3. I want to go back now if I can. Okay, notice this one, gray smoke, it's kind of going horizontal. Black smoke going straight up in the air and then fortunately for Japan over the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the wind shifted two days later and went out over northwest Japan which is where the greatest contamination occurred. Uh, we think, and, and again we don't know yet, we think that there may have been an inadvertent criticality in the fuel pool of, of this particular unit, and that's what caused this much larger explosion at Unit 3. This is Unit 4 at Fukushima. Uh, the interesting thing about Unit 4 uh, is that there was no fuel. As Dr. Polk noted, there was no fuel in the core of this reactor, and yet it still exploded. Uh, we think, uh, again, we'll find out some year, uh, that there might have been hydrogen coming in from the Unit 3 reactor through some shared piping and stuff. Uh, by the way, that red crane, that red 
thing going up the side of the plant there, that's a pump that is pumping water into the fuel pool of Unit 4 uh, to prevent it from, from uh, becoming dry because it was boiling at the time. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to have to go kind of fast through some of this. These are some of the first lessons that uh, my organization took from Fukushima. Uh, first, to close these GE Mark I reactors, uh, the ones that have been identified for 40 years now as being dangerously deficient, we've seen that they are. Uh, close the reactors from most vulnerable to earthquakes, uh, move as much fuel as possible from the pools to the dry path. Uh, a couple others there. Uh, okay, I want to remind you that it doesn't take an accident. Nuclear facilities release radiation routinely. Radiation is invisible, it's odorless, it, it's colorless, you can't feel it, you can't sense it. Uh, if you could, you might notice that uh, nuclear power plants are not as clean as they are made out to be sometimes. And this is important because as the National Academy of Sciences has pointed out, as Dr. DeMarco pointed out, there is no safe dose of radiation exposure. All exposures carry some risk. The risks start very low, go up with the rate of exposure. Uh, and by the way, my organization released a paper yesterday, it's up on our website, uh, that ba based on some information that was in this original report but uh, was pretty much overlooked, women are much more susceptible to radiation exposure than men are. Uh, we've always known that children are more susceptible than adults. Uh, now we're learning that women are more susceptible than men, uh, although we're not sure of the reasons why. Uh, we wanted to talk about sustainability a bit here. Uh, there are, we have a top 10 reasons why nuclear power is not appropriate for the climate crisis. Uh, and in fact, it, we believe it's counterproductive to do with the, counter, the climate crisis. Uh, we're not going to go into all of these tonight, but uh, takes too many reactors. Um, there have been various studies from industry and, and governments. There are currently 440 or so reactors in the world. Uh, 104 of those are here in the United States. According to these various studies, it would take for nuclear power to contribute a 20% reduction in carbon emissions would require a construction program to bring us up to two to 3,000 reactors worldwide, uh, three to 400 in, here in the United States. Uh, it can't be done and it won't be done. Uh, those are some of the other reasons that we might be able to get to some of those. Too expensive is the number one reason why we are not seeing a nuclear renaissance in this country right now. Uh, the Nuclear Energy Institute, in a document they have since taken down from their website uh, in 2006, projected that new reactors would cost about $2,000 per kilowatt hour to build, and the price would drop down to about $1,500 per kilowatt hour. If they could build new reactors for that price, they would indeed be economically viable. Problem is, they can't. Uh, Moody's, $7,000 a kilowatt, their estimate. Standard and Poor's, five to $8,000 a kilowatt. Uh, we've got a reactor that's being built in Finland. It was the first reactor started in the Western world uh, this century, in fact. Uh, it was supposed to be online in 2005. Uh, the new date is 2004, excuse me, it's supposed to be online in 2009. Uh, the new date is 2014. Uh, the construction costs are already 100% overrun and it's up to close to $9,000 a kilowatt right now. Uh, you've probably heard about Solyndra, uh, <clears throat> which uh, some people are trying to make a big scandal out of. It's a solar company that had a great technology that unfortunately was too expensive for its competitors uh, because solar power is getting so darn cheap these days. Uh, we built all those new reactors, three, 400 new reactors. We don't have a radioactive waste program to take care of the waste they would produce, and neither does any other country in the world. Uh, too much carbon. Nuclear is, act, is a low carbon source of energy. There's no question about that. It is not a carbon-free source of energy. Uh, there have been more than 100 studies done on this issue. You know, what is nuclear's role uh, in carbon emissions versus other technologies? A professor named Benjamin Sovacool 
works out of Virginia Tech and the University of Singapore, both went through all 100 studies, threw out the outliers on both sides of the spectrum, uh, and came up with this comparison of nuclear versus the main renewable alternative. Uh, obviously, the fossil fuels are far higher than any of those numbers. Uh, water. Water is an issue that people don't think about, uh, including our policymakers, uh, much when it comes to nuclear power. But nuclear power is the largest water user of any electricity generation source we have, uh, 10 times that of solar thermal. And water is a growing issue across the country, the water supplies. And nobody has yet figured out, has never, has yet even looked at what effect trying to build three to 400 new reactors in this country, what that would do on our uh, water supply. There's uh, some figures about how much water uh, reactors use. I'm gonna skip over these. Uh, liability issues, uh, the Price-Anderson Act was mentioned. That is an act that limits utility liability in this country in the event of an accident. Uh, currently, there's about $12 billion available uh, to pay for damages from an accident. By comparison, uh, a couple weeks ago, the bailout of TEPCO, Tokyo, Tokyo Electric Power, uh, is estimated right now at $112 billion. Uh, obviously, the Price-Anderson Act is not going to cover damages from a U.S. nuclear accident. If we don't go nuclear, what do we do? First of all, we got some com countries that are moving away from nuclear. Japan, the world's third largest economy, until March of 2001, had plans to expand its nuclear production from 30% to 50% of its electricity use. Uh, now they are not planning to build any new ones. Uh, we don't know how many of the existing ones are going to reopen. That's a matter of debate in Japan right now. But they're basically moving away from nuclear power. Uh, Germany, the world's fourth largest economy, uh, closed seven of its reactors, including all of its GE Mark Ones, uh, immediately after Fukushima, and they are now moving away from nuclear power. In Italy, there was a referendum earlier this summer. 95% of those voting in the referendum voted no to nuclear. Italy's out. Uh, Switzerland is making moves away. We've already had some countries. And these are industrialized countries. If they can do it, we can do it. Uh, this, these are the types of energy on one side, the extractive technologies. They take uh, their fuel from the ground uh, and use it in various ways to create energy. These are the non-extractive technologies uh, of the future. And when I say future, one thing that I can say after you know, being in this business for 25 years, 25 years I couldn't, ago I couldn't say this, uh, these technologies are actually ready now. 25 years ago they weren't, they are now. Uh, real quickly, this is wind power potential map in the United States. Uh, as you can see, the Great Plains states are, have huge wind power potential. There was a Department of Energy study about 20 years ago that said South Dakota alone could power the entire country if you could figure out how to get the electricity to the entire country from there. Uh, huge offshore wind potential. A thousand gigawatts of wind power potential off the Atlantic coast alone. Uh, by comparison, the current nuclear capacity is 85 to 90 gigawatts uh, across the U.S. Uh, solar power potential, as you might expect, the biggest part is uh, in south southwest U.S. Germany is the most solar power country in the world right now. It has the same solar power potential as Alaska, which isn't on this map, but it's lower than all of these 50 states. Uh, this is what sustainable energy looks like. This is a U.S. Navy parking lot in San Diego. Uh, those are photovoltaics. They produce uh, three quarters of a megawatt of electricity using a small portion of the parking lot and or you can use it to, to charge your plug-in hybrids during the day. Uh, well, these are just a few of the other potential technologies, and I think we're going to hear some about grids and uh, distributed generation and stuff in a few minutes. 
Uh, that's our basic slogan. And thank you for listening. and constraints, we have an aging workforce. Um, for the students out there that have heard me talk about this, this is a tremendous opportunity. You got all kinds of problems. You're hearing about some of them tonight. Uh, you're our generation that's gonna come out and solve some of them. So I'll talk a little bit about those challenges, and when we talk about challenges, we have to talk about opportunities. They center around everything from technology that needs to be developed and improved upon, to the infrastructure that we're operating in terms of our, our basic need, really, for society, right? What is our basic need? Uh, life is sustained by, by water. Society today, if you want to operate in modern society, you better be electrified. And we are. Modern society is built around and depends on electricity. So our infrastructure is critical to it. We need new R&D to continue to develop the solutions for the future. We need to fix policy with it, and we need to develop uh, a future workforce that addresses these issues in the right way. I'm not gonna go through this whole list, but I've underlined a few things that are important about what we're speaking to tonight. Renewable resources, as have been pointed out, are potential solutions. One thing that I'll say right off the bat, um, you talk about where the renewables are. If you look at those maps that were shown a minute ago, they're nowhere close to where we live, all right? Um, we need to build a lot more transmission infrastructure be able to move that energy to where we use it. Uh, that's not an easy solution right now, and, and it won't be for a long time, okay? Um, also, when we talk about efficiencies, uh, fossil plants, nuclear plants, um, there's a law of physics that keeps that efficiency low, all right? Yet it is still more than twice as efficient than some of the solutions we're looking at in terms of renewables, which we have to continue to work on, believe me. I'm a huge proponent. And, and we need to continue to develop those resources in the best way possible. But right now, uh, solar panels at the best are maybe 15 to 18 percent efficient. That's less than half of what the, the cycle process is for, for fossil and nuclear fuels. Um, the best wind utilization factor that you can get out of the best wind potentials might be in the 10 to 20 percent range, okay? What's different between that and some of the other things that are listed up here, clean coal technologies, nuclear, when I build those plants, and it's 500 megawatts, it's 500 megawatts all the time. Every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, okay? That leads to an important part of this that's really the crux of my topic, which is grid reliability, okay? When I have intermittent resources in the grid, it is very, very difficult to dispatch, balance, and effectively and efficiently deliver, and therefore, accept electricity, okay? If we want to maintain the reliability levels that we have today that society is based on, we need to have high reliability, okay? So there's a role in this for traditional forms of electricity that need to be in play with the development of the new technologies that we're moving towards. So I look at it and say, we need a comprehensive set of solutions, all right? There is no one silver bullet, there's no one answer. There are a host of answers, and really, we're working in all of these areas, and we need to continue to work in all of these areas. Every one of them plays a role. I won't go into the role of every single one. I will say something about the smartly dressed, young, good-looking people up there, and that's all of you out in the audience, all right? You're our generation that's gonna come help solve some of these problems for us. One of the things that our president has said, though, is that 80% um, of our electricity will come from clean energy resources. Some people want wind and solar, Others want nuclear, natural gas, and clean coal. And I agree with this statement. To meet the goals that we have, we're gonna need all of it. So we do need a comprehensive set of solutions. And again, why? Electricity demand and energy demand continue to increase on a global basis, all right? If you look at where we are now, we use a lot of energy, all right? When you leave here tonight, look up what Terra means, okay? <laughs> There's a lot of zeros after that. We use 15 of them. 
in this world and we're going to double that in a very short period of time if i center that on the u s we used about twenty five percent of it ok yes we might not be the most efficient country in the world but if you start to break that out a little bit and get to the context of this evening's discussion about two thirds of that energy is used as electricity all right so when we talk about energy we talk about forms of energy and what it eventually turns into mostly we're talking about electricity all right our electricity to demand in the u.s. alone is going to grow by about twenty five percent within the next twenty years so what are we going to do about that well if we look at our energy portfolio mix today in terms of generation resources it is still predominantly coal we know that that's starting to move down uh, there is a lot of promise in clean coal technologies perhaps we're not as committed to it as we should be uh, coal is there because it's economic okay um, nuclear is economic um, there's a big percentage of it not only in the US but globally but you see some current trends all right increases in renewable resources which uh, again aren't efficient right now we're working on increasing those efficiencies integrating them better and when you don't have efficiency you don't have good economics all right um, moving away from fossils which are very economic all right coal is there because of how cheap it is we have seen a bit of a nuclear resurgence and uh, we are starting to see uh, some more efforts in clean coal if we look at how this all fits into the grid and what our grand challenges are we have to meet this energy demand not just by generation mix but by delivery technologies we're dealing with a century legacy old system um, of AC technology that, that needs to be upgraded and expanded all right we have a lot of technologies that come into play for that one of the biggest issues with it is how do we integrate some of these new forms that have been talked about in the best way possible right how do we get generation close to demand or move it to demand in the right way all right most of these renewables are what we call non-dispatchable because they're intermittent because they're diurnal because they're stochastic because they don't even have very good utilization factors they do not integrate with the grid very well and what happens when we don't integrate with the grid very well we lose reliability reductions in reliability in the grid are the primary concern that we continue to have to deal with okay so I wanted to set that stage because when when you look at all of these issues that we're talking about um, from the DNA level to the plant level to the earth level it comes down to some pretty reasonable aspects that are really in a sense cornerstone to the issue which is how do I move that electricity in the best way possible to where I'm going to use it and how I use it okay if we can't solve that problem none of the generation mix that we're trying to look at is going to make a lot of sense okay that's why there's a role for renewables that's why there's a role for traditional forms of fossil and nuclear and even natural gas okay because we have to balance the energy supply to meet the reliability demands that we have so from my perspective the role of nuclear power actually brings a lot of advantages and benefits okay certainly we have to deal with the technology and the safety side of it and we are dealing with that effectively I think Larry talked about how uh, every incident leads to improvements that's with every evolving technology no matter what it is okay we can certainly and I think for the most part uh, have a very safe nuclear culture here in this country and in many of the other developed nations around the world that use nuclear power but it does provide a clean source of electric power generation today it provides 20 percent of our demand all right if we want to continue to be economic about it it needs to be that much and maybe more and we see that globally as well it provides over 70 percent of the current u.s mix of emission-free electricity actually and it helps reduce not only our NOx and SOx levels, but it also uh, reduces the amount of CO2 that's going into the air each year. So it provides primarily, again from the grid side, a base load resource that leads to grid stability that's critical for future grid expansion, reliability, security, and operation, and an economic resource at that that helps maintain electricity's exceptional value and affordability. All right. 
the one thing that has to be considered in all of this is your electric bill because when it starts to go too high you're going to complain and if we replaced all that nuclear and fossil right now with a lot of these other forms of electricity you wouldn't be able to afford it okay believe me we would not be able to afford electricity as we know it today it is one of the greatest values that is out there okay when you look at the consumer price index uh, very few things have held their value proposition as well as electricity has and utilities and others involved in the industry are under great pressure to continue to maintain that affordability and continue to meet the reliability demands that we have because when the electricity goes out you're not happy with that easily and what happens when the electricity goes out it cripples us like almost no other event that takes place in modern society everything we do today depends on it options for future reactors um, can provide greater dynamic load following capability to improve the dispatching and balancing that we see as we start to bring in some of these other forms of electricity that are intermittent that don't have the same type of inherent reliability that traditional forms of fossil and nuclear energy provide so there is a role for nuclear now and in the future and it fits very well into what we're trying to achieve overall in the power and energy sector for complete reliability economics and I might say sustainability so with that I'll be a lightning rod for questions when we get back up here, but uh, I guess we're not taking any questions right now. Thank you for your attention. All right, well, that was certainly a lot of information to take in in 45 to 50 minutes. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you have questions that are swirling around in your heads as well. Please be sure to write those down on your cards uh, as clearly as you can. Uh, and we'll, we will have the audience uh, question period coming up after our first round of questions here. Um, so I'd like to start off uh, with a basic question to all of the panelists. Uh, it's a very general question, and some of which you've already probably answered in your presentations. Uh, and that is, if you could boil your understanding uh, and concerns about uh, nuclear energy uh, down into just three facts that you wish everyone could know about nuclear energy, what would those be? Let's go right down the line, starting with Dr. DeMarco. Put them on my first slide. Um, I think that we have already contaminated the biosphere with high-level radioactive material that is synthetically created by human activity. We're going to have custody over that for thousands of years. Uh, secondly, that it is an inherently inefficient technology based on the Rankin engine um, and is easily replaceable by um, other kinds of systems. And third, that we really need to focus attention on the demand side. We are not going to solve our energy situation by replacing fuels. The projections for energy needs in the 25 years from now are based on including those inherent inefficiencies in electricity and transportation. We have to find something beyond the horse and buggy days to replace our basic um, economic foundations. Dr. Cole? I have <clears throat> about 10 facts I'd like to uh, portray, but I will just stick to some. One fact is that I think has not been well represented here tonight, and that is the effects of low-level radiation. Low-level radiation may not be harmful and may even be beneficial. We live in a radioactive world. And I would uh, cite the fact that in 1983, a group of 180 apartment buildings was completed in Taiwan, but somebody made a serious mistake. They had mixed into the concrete a considerable amount of highly radioactive cobalt-60. So this means for nine to 20 years, 10,000 people lived in buildings so radioactive that they were receiving 7.4 rims a year. What, what makes this so phenomenal is that the cancer rate for these people who were tracked for up to 20 years was only 4% of the regular cancer rate for people in Taiwan. So there's a lot to be learned about low-level radiation, and I thank my colleagues on both sides have made it clear that no level of radiation is sustainable, or, excuse me, acceptable. Second, on a per megawatt basis, electricity, produced by nuclear power has the fewest fatalities. 
The U.S. does not want for safety assessments of nuclear power. What it needs is an honest public debate about it. And the fatalities for nuclear power on a terawatt basis are less than four times the fatalities that we get from solar and wind. And of course, many times less than what we get from coal. I guess my last one is that I think Fukushima underscores the essential safety of nuclear power. This was truly a worst case event. Yet even with substantial releases, so precautionary are Japan's safety standards and evacuation policies that it is still reasonable to predict that not a single radiation fatality will result from Fukushima, even amidst a natural disaster that claimed 25,000 lives. This is not a statement of complacency or indifference, but a simple fact. Facts favor nuclear power. The challenge is now best to use these facts to alleviate fears, instill confidence, and enhance awareness of nuclear power's environmental value. Two In the three months after Fukushima, several thousands of people have died worldwide, either because of the mining of fossil fuels or from the health consequences of fossil combustion. Viewed in this context of real, large-scale, ongoing lethality, what is now commonly called this nuclear disaster at Fukushima invites a less hyperbolic description. Mr. Marriott? Uh, thank you. Oh, you know, if we all agreed up here, this wouldn't be any fun, would it? Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to do very briefly three things. Uh, first one, it is not possible to take an inherently dangerous technology and make it inherently safe. Uh, you can make it safer, you can make it safer than it is, it's not possible to make it inherently safe. Uh, second, nuclear accidents are not like other types of industrial accidents. Uh, the consequences of nuclear accidents take years and even decades uh, to really see. Uh, we're seeing that at Chernobyl, uh, where the cancer rates, uh, where there's still, you know, 25 years after the accident, there's still tremendous dispute uh, about what the real consequences are. We have everything from uh, <clears throat> some in the industry saying, well, it's only the you know, 38 to 50 or so uh, people who died of acute exposure uh, immediately after the accident uh, to estimates of up to a million and everything in between. Uh, you know, the, the fact is that nuclear accidents do cause health effects. We know that very difficult to pinpoint exactly what they are, but it takes place over years, decades, and as Dr. Uh, DeMarco pointed out, possibly even generations. Uh, the third thing I uh, would leave you with is we believe very strongly that it is possible, it is desirable to achieve a nuclear-free, carbon-free energy future for this country by mid-century. Uh, if you go to our website, there is study after study after study that shows similar but slightly different ways to do that. We believe it can be done and must be done. Dr. Reed? Three things. Uh, one that I'd like everybody to understand is that nuclear power provides a stable and reliable form of electrical energy that contributes to overall grid reliability. Second is that we do have a good safety culture for nuclear technology here in this country and in developing nations. We only need to look to France as one example of where they've done it, they've done it well, and they've done it right. Third, it is an efficient form of energy generation and is cost efficient in the long run compared to all forms of generation options. It's not the only option that we have, it's not the only solution. I talked about a comprehensive strategy, it's what we need. Nuclear has a strong role to play in that comprehensive approach. Thank you. Um, certainly one of the big questions that has uh, been raised by all of you is the matter of risk. Uh, historic nuclear incidents such as Three Mile Island and Chernobyl and especially Fukushima have been covered very well here tonight. Uh, and also Dr. Folk covered how this incident has changed the way the nuclear uh, industry views um, risk and public safety. Uh, I think this really raises an important question that I'd like each of you to um, comment on a little bit, which is, uh, 
uh, how much risk is acceptable. How much, uh, when it comes to the matters of risk and public safety, uh, how much is enough? Dr. Polk, would you like to start? Well, I think the interpretation of risk depends upon your bias. If you are against a nuclear power, you imagine the risks are super significant. If you look at the facts, however, the, the risk from nuclear power, history has shown for over 50 years of operation, that that risk is less than any other means of producing electricity. Nuclear comes in four times lower in risk to human life than does solar and wind on a terawatt hour basis. We need to look squarely at the truth that there is no such thing as a zero risk energy form of generation. Events of the past year in the Gulf, in the mines of West Virginia, and now on the coast of Japan have again taught us that there is no energy source without risk. Dr. DeMarco would like to respond. If you are in the field of public health and epidemiology, the formula for risk is that risk is a function of hazard and exposure. And in the case of nuclear power, you have a situation where the inherent hazard of the material in a nuclear reactor is high level, highly concentrated radioactive material. The exposures are traditionally very small, except for unusual circumstances. But you also have an, an aspect of risk that involves uh, choice. You can voluntarily expose yourself to highly risky situations, and people find that acceptable. Smoking being a clear example of that. Jumping out of airplanes on purpose being an example of that. But we're talking here about exposing for thousands of years populations of people and other living things who have no say in their willingness to be exposed. The contamination of nuclear radioactive isotopes from Auckland to the Arctic has been documented well um, in numerous studies all over the world. And so we are talking about a contamination that is not biodegradable except by natural processes over very long periods of time and those subjected to it in the future and future generations have no choice in the matter. That defines to me as an avoidable, something that we should avoid in the terms of the public risk. Dr. Reed? Pass. <laughs> Mr. Marion. Uh, I, w I would guess I want to say a couple things quickly. Uh, one, because I, I didn't get a chance to say this earlier, but I actually agree with all of the recommendations Dr. Folk made in terms of improving safety after Fukushima. Uh, all of those are important things to do. Uh, and as long as we have nuclear power, they should be done. I, I hope they are done. Uh, I'm not convinced they'll be done, uh, working with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission the way I do, uh, but I hope they are. But, uh, you know, I didn't come to my opposition to nuclear power and then perceive the risk. I perceived the risk first, and then it, that is what caused opposition to nuclear power. Uh, and in my view, uh, the risks are simply too great. And even if you make all these recommendations that uh, Dr. Falk recommended, uh, even if we do all those, and we should, uh, to me, there are better ways to produce our electricity. I'll, I'll let it pass and say, <laughs> absolutely, if they're affordable. All right, we have to get to the economics of this eventually. That's, that's not always at the forefront of the debate, but, but the economics need to be considered. When you're talking about terawatts of electricity that need to be generated and delivered. All right, there are efficient ways to do it, there are inefficient ways to do it. Um, and some of our new forms of generation are not that efficient yet. We need to continue to work on that. I think that's a, uh, a very important point as well. Uh, that you brought up during your presentation was how do we balance risk versus demand versus reliability versus cost. Dr. DeMarco? 89 petawatts, that's 15 zeros, falls on us daily for free from the sun. And if you look at the amount of investment that we've made in the technologies for storing in between a 100% reliable intermittent source 
okay? It's a diurnal cycle. The sun comes up every morning. We never doubt it, okay? What we have not done is invest in the demand side example. If you put the energy planner amid the power plants and the transmission lines, you see a very different picture than if you put the energy planner among the users. If you design for sustainability, you can build a zero net energy building. There are many of them that you can go look at today on, in Pittsburgh right now. We are building an entire campus, a zero net energy, zero net water, and 100% waste recapture design goal. This is not space age technology. It is cost effective, and it's a different definition of efficiency. You have 89 petawatts. That's two more zeros after terawatts, I think, um, that falls on a spree every day. I think the economics can be worked out. Also, the issue of subsidies. The solar and renewable systems are not receiving $11 billion a year in subsidies. Dr. Reed, you also specifically mentioned um, the viability of solar and other alternative sources. Would you like to respond to that? Uh, yeah, they are very viable, absolutely. And, and, and I agree that we need to continue to invest in them. Um, but they are one part of the total equation. I'll continue to come back repeatedly to a comprehensive set of solutions. Um, it, it has its role. It has its role where it's going to be efficient and effective, and there are going to be places and applications where it's not. Um, and right now, it, it's not effective at the bulk generation and transmission level. All right, there's a lot of other infrastructure that needs to go into play that, that has to be considered in the costs and everything else. Um, I want to talk about subsidies and policies. If you look right now at uh, trying to be able to, to move in that direction of more renewables, um, you know, when we have set the right policy to incentivize it, we've seen sharp increases in investment and, and in growth. Uh, when, the, when the incentives go away, it drops off a cliff. And that says that it is not yet mature enough uh, to invest in without some of the subsidies that need to take place. So I, I do believe there's a role for government in here, from a policy point of view, to help us move in the right directions, uh, not only towards these other forms of energy supply, but also continue in, in, in ways to in, improve whatever other risks there are to our traditional forms of supply. And not just nuclear, but, but fossil as well. We have a lot of fossil out there. We depend on it right now, whether you like it or not. Everything that we depend on having this meeting on tonight is largely because of coal, okay? So let's not give up on it. Um, when I have 50% of my total energy supply coming from fossil fuels, if I improve that efficiency by 10% alone, that's better than a 3% increase in renewables, a 30% increase in renewables, okay? Think of it that way, all right? Take the bigger piece of the pie and start to work on improving that at the same time you're trying to grow the small slices, all right? This is starting to get at what I talk about and, and mean when I say a comprehensive approach. Can Thank you. Can we try taking the uh, incentives and subsidies away from the fossil fuels for a while and see what happens? Yeah. Well, then let's take them away from, from everything else that we're trying to develop as well. And, and um, you know, isn't a little that's, uh, that, that's exactly what one of the questions was when we referred to incentives as well. Uh, in terms of government subsidies for energy sources, the playing field um, is not level. Fossil fuels do receive the vast bulk of the government subsidies. Um, does that need to be adjusted uh, to make the current incentive? Uh, what kinds of adjustments need to be made in order to have a more balanced power grid? Would anyone like to uh, jump on that? Um, the president proposed in his State of the Union address that the $39 billion a year subsidies that are going to oil and gas exploration be shifted to renewable power. I think that's a good place to start. That proposal didn't make it out of committee. Call your senator. <laughs> you know, I'll start with oil. Oil brings up a, a good concern. Um, we probably do all agree that, that we're, we need to wean off of oil for sure. And, so what's gonna happen with transportation and what's already happening? It's becoming electrified, okay? So what are we gonna have to do to fuel our vehicles? We're gonna have to produce more electricity affordably, okay?
okay? Because your bill is gonna continue to go up once we start to see you plugging in your electric vehicle in at home, okay? It's gonna look like um, several deep freezers uh, on steroids, all right, in terms of electrical demand. Um, you're gonna want that to continue to be affordable, okay? Uh, you can go to the pump right now and, and, and fill up with petroleum and, you know, we live with $4 uh, a gallon of gas. I don't know how long we're going we're gonna to go with that. Uh, but at the same time, if we start to replace that system with, with electric vehicles, um, you know, you're going to want that price point to be much, much more economical than, than what it is for petroleum. So I think what, what we need to do from that point of view is, is, is really incentivize grid expansion, all right, so that we have the reliability and, and the delivery network and everything else that regardless of the forms of generation that we have are going to be able to supply the new demand that we continue to see. And it's not just demand growth in general, it's the type of demand that we're seeing, um, a whole different uh, element in terms of, of the characteristics of that demand. So those are some subtleties that come into play when we talk about grid reliability. It's, it's a much higher quality of electricity that we have to bring uh, in addition to higher levels of it. Uh, before we shift gears into climate change with Dr. Polk or Mr. Mary, I'd like to chime in. Thank you. Uh, so it's been suggested, as uh, Mr. Mary did cover briefly in his presentation, uh, it's been suggested often in recent years that we need to deploy nuclear power in order to meet uh, emissions reduction goals of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, which many say those goals are not even strict enough. Uh, your thoughts on that? Starting with uh, Mr. Mary. Uh, well, I, I think I made my thoughts pretty clear in my presentation, uh, <clears throat> and I didn't even get into things like nuclear proliferation, uh, that would be caused by building lots more reactors. Uh, <clears throat> but I, well, I think the, the one slide that I, I guess I would emphasize is the one with the quote from Amory Lovitz, a uh, well-known energy expert, where he points out that you obtain fewer carbon reductions per dollar by investing in nuclear power because nuclear power is so much more expensive. And, and, you know, when we talk about economics here, I did point out uh, earlier during my presentation that nuclear power is extraordinarily expensive. Now, the plants that are out there operating now uh, that are paid for, yeah, those, those are providing, you know, pretty cheap power for the most part. Uh, not all of them, but most of them. Uh, <clears throat> the new plants, however, cannot be built without one of two financing mechanisms. One is using your money for loan guarantees, taxpayer money for loan guarantees, or two, using the rate payers as a bank uh, by charging them in advance uh, before the plant is built uh, to cover the construction costs. Now that's only legal in a few southern states, so that's not gonna work in most places anyway. Uh, and that's because the, the costs are so high. Meanwhile, the costs for wind, for solar, have been dropping. I pointed out that Solyndra, which went bankrupt because it's producing solar panels for $3,000 a kilowatt, they went bankrupt because they can't compete with other solar companies that are producing them for $1,000 a kilowatt. Now, when you get down to those kinds of prices, that kind of business becomes viable, and it's what allows the kind of mass production uh, that makes the entire enterprise uh, viable on a massive scale rather than the much smaller scale we've seen so far. Anyone else? I agree with uh, Mr. Mrayoff in that the big disadvantage of nuclear power today is the high investment cost that you must have in order to build the plant. And if you take a short range view, nuclear power looks very unattractive. But on the long-range view, if you look at the life cycle costs over the expected 60-year operation period of a nuclear power plant, the nuclear power is very competitive on an economic basis. And then I just say that the life cycle cost of a nuclear power plant is something closer to 2,000 years because you have to deal with the waste, and that has to be managed, overseen, and protected from 
um, you, they, you mentioned into the biosphere for a long, long, long time. That's a pretty powerful statement to say 2,000 years. I mean, do you have a source a half -life, a half -life for that? Of that has very little to do with the economics, however. Well, that's the problem, isn't it? Somebody is going to have to oversee the waste custody. And we haven't even, the, the back end of the fuel cycle remains basically an artist's confabulation. And I think until we deal with that, it isn't an economic viable option. From a technical standpoint, the back end of the fuel cycle is not a problem. The back end of the fuel cycle is being treated in France and other nations. Uh, we have made a political decision in the United States to not continue with the back end of the fuel cycle. But I believe, uh, Dr. DeMarco, that the actual cost contribution to long-term life cycle cost for the waste situation is not a significant barrier. We have been paying, you and I who use nuclear electricity, we've been paying a tenth of a cent per kilowatt hour in our electricity bills in order to pay for the ultimate disposition of the nuclear, and, and I'm, I have a little difficulty of referring to nuclear spent fuel as waste. 97% of the nuclear spent fuel is reusable uranium. But our policy in the United States today is like buying a six pack of beer, buying one can, and throwing five cans away. Because we do not recycle. And other nations who do recycle find that it is worthwhile, economic, and the ethical thing to do. I think it is worthwhile to switch to a, a question on nuclear waste. Uh, Mr. Marriott would like to respond before we uh, take that, although he may be right on the same topic too. Well, yeah, I was going to talk about waste for just a moment. Fire away. Uh, <clears throat> and Dr. Falk is correct in what we are paying into the nuclear waste fund, uh, at least those of us who uh, get electricity from nuclear power. Uh, the problem is, the fund has collected over the years, uh, I don't know the exact amount, somewhere between 20 and 30 billion dollars. The Yucca Mountain project that was canceled by President Obama uh, a couple of years ago was projected to cost a hundred billion dollars. So the fund was never going to pay for the waste site and Yucca Mountain was never going to hold all of the waste from all of the reactors and new reactors. Uh, wasn't big enough to do that. So the fund was going to fall woefully short. Uh, <clears throat> now to go to reprocessing for just a moment. Uh, yes, France does reprocess uh, some of its fuel, uh, not all of it by any means. They are still looking for a radioactive waste site of their own and they can't find one uh, that doesn't have massive public opposition. But the reprocessed fuel is more expensive than simply mining the uranium and enriching it the normal way. The reprocessed fuel has an economic value of zero. Uh, so it's not, while technically achievable, yes, it is technically achievable. It's kind of dirty, uh, but it's technically achievable, but it's not economically viable. Thank you. Uh, certainly there are um, many more questions and many more answers to be had here this evening. We'd like to move on to some audience questions. Uh, if uh, anyone from the audience is prepared with a question, would like to step up to the microphone, we can even form a line going back if you'd like. Uh, and we'll take a, a couple of questions uh, at a time and, and see what we can get. I think it's uh, quite extraordinary, a, a kind of Alice in Wonderland that an oral discussion of nuclear power, uh, there's a complete absence of concern about nuclear weapons, nuclear proliferation, the risks of nuclear war. The history of nuclear power, and contemporaneously, nuclear power is inextricably connected to the question of nuclear weapons and nuclear proliferation. The risk of nuclear proliferation is increasing progressively. Uh, people who have looked at this believe that the dangers of nuclear war resulting from deliberate decisions, inadvertent uh, uh, consequences are increasing 
exponentially as time goes by. There's no question that the multiplication of nuclear power plants greatly increases the danger of proliferation of nuclear materials and nuclear weapons. You can give lots of practical, concrete examples of that. Uh, we are spending huge amounts of money. There is a great crisis in the world that everybody is worried about, war with Iran and the dangers of Iran. There's no question that the proliferation of nuclear power inevitably will fuel and greatly increase the proliferation of nuclear weapons. The probability of ultimate nuclear weapons use and nuclear war increases as time goes by. And that has not been mentioned at all by any of the proponents of nuclear weapons or nuclear power on the podium and the great economic benefits of nuclear power and so forth. So I'd appreciate it if people would comment on that. That is a true elephant in the room that nobody has commented on. Thank you. Dr. Falk? I would like to address that question. Uh, I, too, share your concern about nuclear proliferation. However, you could shut down every nuclear power plant in the world today, and you would not stop nuclear proliferation. So I think there is a big question as to whether or not in today's world that nuclear power plants are related to nuclear weapons. The easy path to a nuclear weapon today is to mine your own uranium and create your own enrichment capability to enrich your own mined uranium to the fissile material needed for a weapon. For reactors which are used to make electricity, you do not make very good nuclear weapons material. The easy path is not through reactors. Uh, if I could, you don't need a very good nuclear weapon to cause millions and millions of deaths. The use of a very small part of the nuclear weapons that are available in Pakistan and India today would cause the death of millions upon millions of people. And in fact, studies have shown that it might lead to worldwide starvation uh, due to nuclear weapons. So you're you're dealing with extraordinary risks. Uh, and, and they really have not addressed, I think the attitude is very cavalier, and it, it, it relates to the kind of attitude that, that perhaps low-level nuclear web, uh, radiation is good for you. That's part of the, the, the story we've gotten from day one, that nuclear power would be so cheap that uh, we wouldn't even have to pay for it. Uh, before I respond, I just would like to mention in passing and almost uh, jocularly that Louis Strauss, who made that statement, did not say when nuclear power would be too cheap to meet. And so perhaps when we get fusion and we use seawater as the fuel, that may happen. I say that in jest, so please don't sneer too badly at that. But the weapons use is probably going to come from the theft of a weapon in some country that does not protect their weapons. Uh, to make a nuclear weapon out of plutonium, reactor grade plutonium, is no easy task. However, making a weapon out of the fissile material from uh, the U-235 that you enrich clandestinely in your country from uranium that you mine, that is an easy weapon to make. So if a terrorist is going to make his own weapon, they're going to not use plutonium. But my, my feeling is that the use of a weapon, I believe, is very probable in the future. And that will probably come from the theft of existing weapons. That's my personal opinion. Mr. Mary? I have no facts to support. Uh, very scary personal opinion. Uh, I hope you're wrong. Uh, but I want to point out about uranium enrichment. Um, it's basically the same technology uranium enrichment plants that make reactor fuel, which is uranium that is enriched to about 5%, or fuel, uh, material for weapons, which is uranium that's enriched to about 80%. Same plant. In fact, you can do both in the same plant at the same time, and we did it for many, many years here in the United States. Uh, uh, in fact, in the state of Ohio and the state of Kentucky. Uh, <clears throat> we both produced fuel for reactors and uh, materials for nuclear weapons. Uh, we're not doing the weapons part anymore. 
unfortunately but it's the same technology sometimes the same plant and it allows countries like iran for example which is you know been you know highly controversial even building a uranium enrichment plant well they say it's for peaceful purposes they, they say it's for nuclear power and the world is powerless to stop them from doing that uh, if it's for nuclear power but of course that same plant can be turned around and used uh, to produce material for nuclear weapons. And uh, Dr. Folk mentioned theft. I'll just mention Iran stole the, doc the blueprints for its uranium enrichment plants from a company called Urenco, which is European uranium enrichment company. Uh, they got it took second hand through uh, a guy in Pakistan. But so th that's how proliferation spreads, and it spreads easily when it's the same technology. Would you clarify when you say plant? You mean an enrichment plant and not a nuclear reactor? Correct. You, you mean an enrichment plant, no, not a reactor. No, it's much, uh, trying to do it from a nuclear reactor is much harder. Thank you. Uh, do we have additional questions from the audience? Step up to the microphone, please. That's fine. Yeah. Right. One minute to state questions, please, and then. Yeah. Um, I, just, I have an older brother who actually came in uh, last Thursday for nuclear night, and he works for. Uh, electric boat. He works on the shielding design for um, some of the nuclear submarines here. The topic I'd like to ask all the whole panel, all the panelists here are um, if we were to cut back on nuclear energy, what would be the next approach to uh, you know, power the nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers here in the United States, which are vital to our defense? Thanks. Anyone? Well, I don't foresee that the nation's defense posture going to cut back on the uh, naval nuclear uh, warships. Uh, and I think I want to mention here that to show the excellent record of nuclear power, consider that the nuclear Navy has steamed over 140 million miles using 5,300 reactor years without the release of any radioactivity that has caused harm to a human. And we've had over 100,000 sailors living on those nuclear submarines, probably uh, maybe 20 feet from the reactor. And to the best of my knowledge, none of those nuclear submariners have fathered a child with any deformities. I think the nuclear Navy record is a very strong statement in support of the safety and effability of nuclear power. And I'm going to second Larry's comments. and. Uh, I don't see an alternative, and, and I think the record speaks for itself. Some close friends were in the nuclear navy. Um, I have family members like you, but some very close friends, and uh, uh, you know, it, it's uh, it has, as Larry mentioned, it has been proven safe, and there's tremendous support for it, and uh, we're doing it in the right way. It's a great example. Uh, I'll just be real quick. I actually kind of agree that I, particularly for submarines, I don't see that there's uh, an alternative that's going to be uh, used anytime soon. Uh, you know, maybe a world that didn't need nuclear submarines might be a good idea. Uh, uh, <coughs> I don't know uh, if there's ever actually been a comprehensive study of uh, the sailors who have worked on the nuclear submarines. I mean, I mean typically, uh, I don't know if they spend entire careers there or not. Uh, somebody else might know better than I do, but I don't know if there's ever been a study by them of, of these people, and that would be an interesting uh, thing to look at. Uh, I will point out, uh, and there may be a lot of uh, cultural and other reasons for this, but the Russian nuclear navy has not been quite as successful. But in general, we have a question that we all agree on. Any other questions from the audience, please? Too many people know about the Church Rock spill of 1979, which happened in New Mexico um, in Navajo, Navajo Nation. And it's actually the largest radioactive accident um, here in the continental United States. So I was wondering um, 
how we can prevent such accidents in the future. I'd like to address the, um, the issue of nuclear material mining. Uh, uranium mining takes place in several countries, Canada being one. Uh, there is some in our country, Kazakhstan, um, and there are about 10 places where it's mined regularly. The, there are two issues here. One are the regular mining industrial kinds of accidents, but secondly are the tailings, the ores that are not quite high enough grade to become processed into uranium and removed. They tend to have leachate in a lot of these areas do not have the kind of environmental protections that we have in our mining industry, as marginal as some of them are. Um, and you do have significant issues of contamination of water. It's an environmental justice issue in a lot of ways because many of the communities where these mining uh, operations occur are populated by people who basically don't feel they have any other alternative. And it is a, an action where the extraction process of extracting resources from the earth is widely displaced from the point where it's used. We are separated from the effects of the mining and um, the extraction industry. So this is an issue of, of, again, intergenerational justice and intercultural justice. I think we need to keep in mind the difference in the amount of mining it takes to support nuclear power relative to mining for other energy production methods. Uranium mining is an environmentally damaging activity. However, in context, it is less damaging than coal because so much coal needs to be mined compared to uranium. Uh, yeah, well, you know, whenever I hear somebody say, well, you know, nobody's died from nuclear power in the United States, uh, I invite them to meet some of the people from the Navajo tribes that I've met over the years, uh, because many people have died from uranium mining in the United States. Uh, and that's why the Navajo Nation has, in fact, banned uranium mining on their land. Uh, yet you've been asked to uh, call your Congress members a couple times here tonight for various reasons. Uh, I want <clears throat> to point out that currently in Congress, there's, or there has been for the last several months an effort uh, to allow uranium mining in Grand Canyon National Park, uh, which I think is just uh, absurd and obscene. And I encourage you to uh, contact your Congress members to stop this. Uh, the Department of Interior uh, is trying to stop it, and some in Congress are trying to overturn the Department of Interior's decision. Uh, and finally, uh, Dr. Falk is correct, coal mining is worse. Uh, no nukes, no coal, no kidding. Any further questions from the audience? Thank you. Hi. I have uh, two questions. The first one, um, why isn't conservation stressed more in this country? Um, I rarely hear it talked about. You know, a few people, a few of you mentioned it briefly, but it strikes me that that should be like our number one priority. Um, uh, and I'd also be interested, I have not seen any like hard statistics as to if we did really conserve, and I'm not talking about walking around in your main coat, excuse me, uh, or fake main coat. Opening comments uh, in your presentation about demand projections. Uh, and does that reflect conservation in any way yeah, uh, also related to this question? It does. And, and, and you ask a, a great set of questions, actually. And the first thing to, th to make sure we understand is the difference between conservation and efficiency. Okay? Um, conservation comes down to changing behavior. All right? We are used to a certain quality of life that, like it or not, we're not willing to really, you know, uh, sacrifice much of. I've asked students in my class, most of the generation that's out here, are you the generation that starts to back down from the larger living spaces and the number of cars and devices and TVs and gadgets that we have? And their answer was no. I like all my stuff. And I can't wait to get my first job and build a bigger house than the one I grew up in and have more cars than my parents owned and more gadgets in that house, okay? So we're not quite there yet in terms of, of being willing to have a lower quality, perceived quality of life. 
and, and conservation is just what you said. It's doing without. It's doing with less, but not necessarily not doing, okay? Whereas efficiency is really technology. Efficiency you can really equate to saying, I'm going to still have all these lights on, but I'm going to do it with less energy than it produces. I'm going to replace all these, um, uh, you know, you know, fluorescence with, with incandescence, and, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reduce the amount of energy it takes to get the same lighting effect in the room. Conservation is I turn half of them off, okay? Or I don't even turn the heat on at all, okay? I get used to a style of life in the wintertime that, you know, I'm just going to be a little bit more uncomfortable. It's all around quality of life, and until we change human behavior around that, we're, we're, we're not going to fix that, okay? But we need to. I mean, we need to conserve more, okay? There's sustainability in the balance.